I want to speak to you this morning on the subject of the sure thing investment. The sure thing investment. Matthew 6, 19 says this. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. How many of you understand that there are a lot of thieves that uh, aren't breaking the laws of the land, but they're still financial thieves? How many of you understand it's easy to lose your money on the wrong investments? But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Father, I pray in Jesus' name there will be great anointing on this unworthy servant that you will use me simply as a conduit, as a vessel. And I pray that you will give your people ears to hear. Let them hear not information from a man, but revelation from God. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, you may be seated. Well, I can't tell you how good it is to be back at the house. You know, the last time I think I was here, I was here to participate in the handoff to the next legacy generation. Amen? Pastor uh, Glenn and Debbie were handing this wonderful mission and ministry off to pastors Micah and Lindsay. What a great moving, emotional, powerful day that was. And then the time before that that I was here, I was here to witness a resurrection against all odds God raised Pastor Glenn up from the dead. I don't know if all of you know that story. Hopefully you'll hear it from him soon. It's one of the most powerful stories I personally have ever heard, how that God raised him up. Thank God he's still preaching with fire. Amen. And being here in the house of Modesto stirs up so many wonderful memories for me because I've been here since the beginning of Pastor uh, Glenn's pastorate here in leadership, and Pastor Debbie, and I've been privileged to watch you through the years. Some of you may not know the history of this church. I've, I've watched this church become a habitation of God with dynamic prophetic prayer meetings, numbering at times in the thousands on Monday nights. Pastor Deborah, a real spiritual warrior of God faithfully and powerfully led that charge. And who can forget hearing about the 30,000 plus people who gave their lives to Jesus just in one series of meetings here in this house. Imagine that, 30,000 giving their lives to Christ in one series of meetings. Um, and of course, who can who can forget the fact that in this house there have been so many hundreds of powerful, unforgettable messages that have been preached under the heavy anointing of God by Pastor Glenn. And Pastor Glenn has passionately pursued souls throughout his life. And he always emphasized the altar. And you know, I, I've been all over the world preaching and I've had an opportunity to hear about things that God is doing at places just like this all over the world. But I can tell you that I don't personally know of any place anywhere in the world where more people 
have been born again at an altar than in this house. God has done a great thing here. And I was talking to Pastor Glenn earlier this week, and he said, he said, it's the same thing. He said, Micah just took over, and he just took over where I left off. He said, it's amazing. The altars are still full. People are still giving their lives to Christ. And walking into this place, all I can say to you is, I know just because of what I sense and feel in the Spirit, the best is yet to come. Pastor Micah and Lindsay are going to lead a new charge. And God is going to do more than He has ever done. There's no shortage of vision and strategy and manpower in this house. This is a rare place. But there is a shortage of investors. There is a shortage of investors. Jesus said, lay not up for yourselves. And if you are reading along in your Bibles and you can underline that, I want you to underline for yourselves. Jesus was talking about an investment that you would make to have return, say it with me, for it's hard to say that, isn't it? Because we've never noticed that in Scripture before. Don't lay up for treasures on the earth. Why? Because you'll lose them. It's a bad investment. But then he says this. Lay up for yourselves. Somebody say for yourselves. Treasures in heaven. So Jesus is not against you laying up treasures. He's against bad investments. And so he says, I want to give you an investment that will work every time. I want to give you a sure thing. You know, I know that you've probably asked in recent days, just like I have. Where do you put your money? What will work anymore? A pandemic assaults our finances. A political upheaval assaults our finances. A world that is in chaos assaults our finances. It's just crazy. Where do you put your money? Everybody's got that brother-in-law who says, I met a guy. You ever get into an investment like that? The old I met a guy investment? This guy knows. How do you know he knows? I just know he knows. And he says that you can make 30%. Oh, really? In how long? Well, I made 30 last month. Really? What's that guy's name? Well, his name's Pete Ponzi. <laughs> you, you see, it, it's so dangerous out there right now. I mean, where do you invest? Well, Jesus says this, and I believe that you can believe him. How many of you think you can believe Jesus? He says, I want you to take your money. And I want you to put it into the kingdom of God. And if you put it into the kingdom of God, I will guarantee it. I will see to it that you not only do not lose it, but it will be a sure thing investment. Now, this church is in need today. There's no shortage of vision, strategy, or manpower here. But there is a shortage of investors. You say, well, can we pay our bills? Oh, absolutely. This, this church is as solid as the rock of Gibraltar. This, 
This place is financially sound. You're not only paying your bills, you've got money in the bank, but this church has a vision bigger than the group of investors that have committed so far. I said this church has a vision that is larger than the current group of investors. Let me say that one more time. This church has a vision that is so large, the current group of investors can't cover it. So today, I've come from Shreveport, Louisiana to see if I can recruit some investors in the kingdom of God. You say, well, I don't understand what you mean, Pastor. If you say the church is solid, we've got money in the bank, things are going well, what you're talking about that we don't have enough investors, well, let me explain it to you. Until we can afford to feed and clothe every child in Modesto, we need more investors. Until we can afford to rehabilitate every addict, we need more investors. Until we're able to set every victim of human trafficking free and give them a new start, we need some more investors. Until we're able to afford putting a Bible in every prisoner's hand and putting a chaplain on every cell block, we need some more investors. Until we can afford to promise all little children with no hope a Christian education and give every family sleeping on the streets a roof over their heads, we need some more investors. Until we can afford to fully support every foreign missionary who received a call at this altar. Until we can fully finance our church plants all over the world. There is a need for investors. The house is doing great things for God in the world. But with more money and more investors, everything in this city could look different. Have you ever noticed how we just parrot things we hear? You know, we just, just kind of repeat, parrot things that we hear. We do that in the kingdom of God. The other day I was with a man, and I was talking to him about the need for capital in the kingdom. For people to begin to have a burden to invest financially in the kingdom. And he just parroted this thing. He said, well, there, there, no, 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 Pastor. There, there's plenty of money. There's just not enough vision. Money always follows vision. Let me just say this. If you are making that statement, you have not thought it through. All due respect, you're brilliant, wonderful, I know. You're thoughtful, prayerful, but you just haven't thought that one through. I live in Shreveport, Louisiana. I'm going to tell you something. I have got enough vision for a $10 million offering today. You give me $10 million today, it is committed tomorrow. I have enough vision for $100 million. If you give me $100 million, I'm not investing it in stocks and bonds. I am going to do something to feed the hungry. I'm going to do something to clothe the naked. I'm going to do something to see that a city is turned upside down for the glory of Almighty God. Do you think that if Pastor Micah had an infusion of millions of dollars this week that he would not start planning to implement the things that have been burning on his heart for months I can tell you everything would look different with more investors. Well, Pastor, I'm just praying I'll win the lotto. And if I can win the lotto, I'm going to give God His portion. Well, Pastor, I can just tell you that, uh, you know, we're praying that some big givers will move in. 
We're praying that some money people will start coming to this church. I want to stop right now, and I want you to look at me, and I want you to hear what I'm about to ask. Why not you? Why shouldn't you aspire to be God's investor? You say, I'm a widow. Oh, really? Well, do you think that God is able to take a widow and do something miraculous in her life and make her an investor? Well, I'm I'm just newly married. We're a young couple. Hey, Pastor, we can hardly afford a bed. Do you think that God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills and all the potatoes under the hills is able to wave his hand and make you the most prosperous couple in Modesto? Do you think that God who is able to raise the dead with the sound of his voice that God, who at creation called everything out of nothing with just the sound of his voice, cannot fulfill the prophecies of this book over your life and use you? You think that God, who took slaves out of Egypt and marched them to a promised land, and from that point to this point, begin to bless them and prosper them as a nation to the point that they control the finances of the globe, cannot take you as a member of his church and turn things around. You see, I'm looking for investors who believe that God could use them. I'm looking for those of you who believe he can change your situation. He can change your bottom line, that he can change your net worth, that he can change your job description and your self-description, and he can transform everything to the point that he can use you to do it, you to accomplish it, you to turn it around, you to make a difference. I, uh, I, went, I went to a preacher's hunt a few months ago. In fact, it's February. Who cares? February. And uh, I was the only preacher there not hunting. Because about four or five years ago, I went to the hunt for the first time. It was about 50 pastors from all over the country. And um, I hunted for the first time. I, I didn't grow up shooting guns. or and So they put a shotgun in my hand. And we, uh, we went out to the target range. And then in just a few minutes, we were shooting pheasants. Well, some were shooting pheasants. I was missing pheasants. I'm going to tell you, I was the pheasant's best friend in that hunt. I believe if they could have talked to each other, they would have said, fly toward the guy in the blue hat. You're safe that way. That's the way out. So, sure enough, uh, after the first hunt was over, they gave me a special dispensation. They said, you can still come to the pastor's hunt, and you don't have to hunt. In fact, we would rather that you probably didn't. I think that they were afraid that probably I would maim some of the men of God because I didn't even know the safety rules of the gun. And so I was there at the hunt. And they always would bring to this hunt special, powerful, anointed men of God. This year it was Tommy Barnett from Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, I think last year it was Jensen Franklin. The year before that... It was um, John Maxwell, the great motivator. And um, this year, not only was Pastor Tommy Barnett, who's my fave, 
uh, there to speak. But also, there was a gentleman there uh, by the name of David Green. Now, you may or may not recognize that name, but that's the guy who started and still runs Hobby Lobby. And so, David Green is an amazing, amazing believer. He, he loves God with all of his heart. Many of you remember that he was the one that, that bought ORU. That is, he really bailed them out of financial problems and made it a, a great um, university again. Uh, he, he also has, over these last years, done something that I don't know anybody else in the world that has done this, but he has made it a practice to buy facilities, sometimes very large facilities, and to give them to Christian ministries and churches. So he would buy an industrial complex, perhaps, and he would give it to someone who had a feeding ministry. He has spent not just a few million dollars on this, but to date, he has given $1 billion worth of facilities to Christian ministries. You say, well, how in the world do you get to that place where you can be that kind of investor in the kingdom of God? Here's what the Word says. If you are faithful over little, God will make you ruler over much. You know, I've heard people who have made this statement. If God ever blessed me with millions, I would give it to the kingdom of God. And knowing the individual sometimes, I was able to say in my heart, no, you wouldn't because you don't have a lot of money right now and you can't afford to even tithe. How do the David Greens get started? I'll tell you how. With a small shop making picture frames in his garage. If he were to sit here and hear my statements this morning, back when, he would feel exactly like some of you. This guy is talking pie in the sky. He's, he's in dreamland. I, I what is he saying to me? He knows, does he know I don't have a dollar in the bank? He would have been probably just like you. Does he understand that, that my business is run out of my garage, that what I do is sell picture frames, but yet somewhere in his life he grasped hold of the fact that if I am faithful over little, there is no limit how God can use me as an investor. And he determined, I want to invest in the kingdom of God. He said his business began to grow very, very rapidly. And as it grew, he began to feel pretty good about himself. Ooh, I have some business acumen here. I'm, <laughs> I'm pretty good at this. And he said, the Lord spoke to his heart and said, David, if you think this is you, I'm just going to let you have it for a while and see how you do. And immediately the business began to nosedive. He very quickly repented. He said, Lord, I'm not the smart guy you are. Lord, I'm, I'm not the brains behind this business you are. Lord, I, I surrender. And he freshly surrendered to the Lord and things began to soar. And as they soared, he gave more and more. You know why? Because he's called not to preach. You know that he's the only one in his preacher kid family. He is a preacher's kid and he comes from a large family. He's the only one of his siblings that isn't preaching. You know what he's doing? Investing. I am an investor in the kingdom. Oh boy, I felt God's presence in a, like, a, like a, a wind just now. God's presence. 
is here. God's going to do something powerful. Let me just say this to you. When I preach a message like this, it's going to go over the heads of most of you. But there will be somebody here. There will be a David Green here. There will be a young woman with a dream here. There will be that vision to finance and establish that orphanage and to pay for it yourself. There will be that dream to be able to go into San Francisco or Sacramento or here in Modesto and see the devil defeated in the area of human trafficking. Oh, those dreams. Because we want to be investors. David Green began to grow as a business. His Hobby Lobby took off. Everybody knows about Hobby Lobby. You can't buy a picture frame on Sunday at Hobby Lobby anywhere in the world. And by the way, you can't get a chicken sandwich at Chick-fil-A because those two men have held the line determining that what they do, they do for the kingdom of God. At the preacher's retreat, David Green began to give his testimony, and then he said this. just took a few minutes, actually. I could have sat there and listened to him for a day. But he just took a few minutes, and he said, you know, guys, he said, recently, as I've sought the Lord, the Lord began to speak to me and said, David, you say my business is yours. How many of you think that if you'd given a billion dollars to churches around the world, and Christian ministries around the world that you could safely say that your business belonged to the Lord. How many? I mean, I could raise my hand and say, I think my business belongs to God. And yet God speaks to David Green and says, David, your business doesn't really belong to me. He said, Lord, what am I doing? He said, no, no. He said, legally, it doesn't belong to me. Contractually, it doesn't belong to me. He said, it belongs to your children. And so <laughs> David Green Called his kids in and he said, kids, uh, this is what the Lord's saying to me. Well, his children bought in immediately because they too understand that they are not called to be wealthy. They are called to be investors. And if you become an investor, God will make you wealthy whether you want it or not. Because he trusts you above other people. And so they just said, we're all in, Dad. And so he had the papers drawn up by lawyers. He had his business changed into what is called a, a guided trust. And do you know who the benefit factor, the beneficiary, I should say, the beneficiary of this guided trust is? It's Almighty God. It's the kingdom of God. It's the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, what I want you to understand is this is a real calling. This is a real calling. And when people believe and lay hold to the promises of blessing that the Word of God makes to those that give, it changes their lives and it also changes the capacity that we have as a church to change the world. I want to know this. How many of you in this place would actually say, Pastor, this is something that is burning in my heart. You say, if God allowed me to be blessed and He chose me to prosper, you say, I would love to be an investment specialist in the kingdom of God. I would love to invest, to be an investor in the kingdom of God. I want my legacy to be that I was an investor in the kingdom of God. Here's all I want you to do. I want you to stand for one moment 
And then we're going to sit. I'm not done preaching yet, but I want you to stand. Because a few more things I want to share with you. I want to look you in the eye. I want to see who you are. I want to see who you are. Now, listen to me. Listen, listen to what I have to say. Please look and listen. Nobody here is edging you out. Don't, don't be distracted by how many people are standing because there's room for all of us. There's that much work that has to be done. I'm a football coach in Shreveport, Louisiana. I'm a head football coach at 70 years old. Think of that. And let me just tell you something. I wake up every morning and go to school with my hair on fire, and those young coaches cannot stay with me. But one of the things that my boys have been taught to do is this. I'll stand before them and I'll say, does anybody have any news today? And one of them will raise their hand and say, yes, sir, I got news today. I say, well, tell us what our news is, Jacob. And that big old offensive tackle will stand up and say, well, I got bad news and I got good news. The bad news is that we got a lot of work to do. The good news is we get to do it. But here's the good news. We get to do it. Wow, isn't that amazing? We get to do it. Lift your hands all over this place. And Father, before I go any further, this is what I pray. I pray, oh God, that everyone here will understand that you are willing to answer this prayer. That if we are faithful over little, you are going to make us ruler over much. And when we rule over what you give us, this is the commitment we make. We are going to invest. We are going to invest in your kingdom. Remain standing. I'm going to ask the musicians to come. The presence of the Lord is here. I don't need to go any further. God is here in a powerful and an amazing way. Mario Morello said something to me years ago. We were kind of kid preachers together in our 20s. And he said, Denny, he said, you know, in the area of sowing and reaping, because how many of you understand, and this is a agricultural area, that sowing is the best example of all of investment. So the seed goes into good ground. And then because it is put in good ground, there is an expected and anticipated and a sure harvest. This is what Mario said to me. He said, what I have discovered about sowing and reaping is you reap in the same area a row that you sow. And he said, God is very, very specific about it. So, if I decide that I'm going to take in a friend's child who is troubled and try to help them in my home for a period, then I know that if my child gets in trouble, God will see to it that someone takes him in. How many of you are hearing this? This is, this is going to change your life. I can tell you, if you'll listen. This is the way God's economy works. You see, what a lot of you don't understand is this. Jesus just didn't save you to go to heaven. He saved you to give you an abundant life on the earth. His, his first statement to Adam was this subdue the earth do you know that when 
God made covenants with people throughout the Bible that one of the first things that he did was to give them land, territory. When the gospel began to be preached in the first generation church, those Christians so quickly began to be a dominant force that they had to start killing them to keep them from taking over all of Jerusalem. Do you understand that Bible scholars say that that early church in Jerusalem could have numbered 50,000? They had to persecute them and split them up and everywhere they went. Within a generation, they had effectively reached the known civilized world. We are called not to be the tail, but to be the head. We are called to take our message powerfully and effectively to the nations. And what I will tell you is that when God begins to move on us in this manner, I, I'm shocked. Here, here's the truth. Pastor, Pastor Joy, I, I, I am shocked by this response. You, you know what this is? This is an extremely healthy church. I, I've never had a response like this to an invitation like that. And I, I'm just kind of shocked, really. But I know God's up to something. Hallelujah. Praise God. Here's what Jesus said about what you are doing. He said, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet, with all it shall be measured to I eat oatmeal in the mornings. You say, why do you do that? Because I like it. I really like it. And it uh, gives me energy. I'm ready to go. Got my carbs. My brain's healthy. I'm ready to go. And, and I have a couple of scoops. And when I'm trying to lose weight, I use the small one. When... I just want to eat good, I use the big one. So you can tell what path I'm on by the scoop I use. Now that's exactly the language that is being used here. If you want God to do great things in your life, then you have to begin the process with a big scoop. With the same measure that you meet, shall it be measured to you again. Getting back to this Mario thing, Mario Morella said, it'll be exactly the same. If you sow mercy, then you're going to reap mercy. If you sow, if you sow kindness, you're going to reap If you sow money, you're going to reap. If you sow cars, you're going to reap. Say, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. I'm telling you, God taught me on this, and it blew my mind. It, it did. But I got to share it with you. When I left, the day I left professional football, I was signed with the Washington Redskins in 1976. It was probably going to be the easiest gig I'd ever had because they were only after one position that they had not fulfilled on that team, and that was the third quarterback. 
and they needed a young guy that wasn't going to make that much money, and that was me. I was the only one in camp. The Lord spoke to me on one day. He said, this is your last day. I've called you to another place. And so I walked out of camp. I talked to Coach Allen, shared Christ with him, prayed with him. And when I started the next couple of weeks on my first evangelistic crusade, I gave my car away because I didn't want to have that expense. I was flying almost everywhere I went. My dad took my little sports car and he drove the wheels off that thing. He thought it was the coolest thing in the world. I went to the very first crusade that I went to. And there was a man sitting on the front row, leaning on a cane. And he's staring at me, almost uncomfortable. I didn't know if he liked me or not. And after the meeting was over, he, he got up and he walked over to me and he said, first thing he says to me, what are you driving? First thing. Not hello, liked your message, didn't like your message, just what are you driving? I said, I said, pardon me? He said, what are you driving? What car? What car? What are you driving? I said, well, I'm not driving a car. I don't have a car. I, I gave it away because, you know, I'm in ministry. He said, follow me. And he said it so forcefully that I just followed him. I, I don't know. I just, I just did. We, I, there were people wanting to pray with me, and, and I, I followed him out the front door. And this man's so forceful. And he just, we just walked out, and, and I got to the car that he drove. It, beautiful, brand new. Smell the new in the foyer of the church kind of new. I mean, Coupe de Ville Cadillac, gorgeous thing. Man, beautiful. Right off the showroom floor. There it is. And he gets in the passenger side, takes stuff out of the glove compartment, and then he hands me keys and said, it's your car. I said, sir, whoa, 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 wait. I said, I am not taking your car. He said, oh, yeah, you are. He said, the Lord told me to tell you that just because you don't play football anymore and don't get football money, he's still going to take care of you. But listen, you got to hear it. You got to hear it. Okay. What are the factors here? First of all, football, right? That's a factor in this story. Here's the second thing. What is it? It's a car. Mario said to me, God always does it in the same row. When I was playing in the World Football League two years earlier, I'd gotten a great contract. In fact, they gave me three times what the NFL was going to give me out of high school, out of college. There was one more check I was going to get, and it was a big one. And that was for making the 38-man roster. And I was so overwhelmed with this, I began to pray, God, that's a lot of money. God, give me that money in Jesus' name. And so I'm praying about it, and it's kind of like at the top of the list of my prayers. And finally, one day, the Lord asked me in a sentence, have I not taken great care of you? And I said, Lord, you've taken great care of me. He said, well, I was just wondering because you're so concerned about this money. I said, Lord, give me the money. And I will give it all away. I got the check. I sent half that check to a fledgling young evangelist who had literally run the wheels off his car. It was, it was a mess. He bought a brand new automobile, first one he'd ever had. I sent the other half to another man that was pastoring in Mississippi. A man, I, I'd led both of them to Christ. And he bought a brand new car, first one he'd ever had with that money. When I was driving away out of that parking lot in that new Cadillac, the Lord spoke to me and he said, I want you to understand I never forget an investment that is made in my kingdom. I want you right now to lift your hands all over this place, or if you're comfortable with just bowing your head, let me just say this to you. There are several young people, when I say young people, I'm talking about teenagers in this crowd, that God is going to give you ideas, and you are going to have wealth beyond anything you ever dreamed 
and you will follow through with the promise you made to God today. You will become that David Green. You will become that financier of the kingdom of God. You will come back to the house in Modesto and you will give more than you ever dreamed you could give. I want to speak to every widow. I want to speak to every person that has been divorced, every single mom. I want to speak to every struggling young couple. And I say to you, do not look to the left or the right. Keep your eyes straight ahead because God is about to absolutely change your world. It will start gradually at first, but then it will burst upon you like the sunrise. It will be glorious beyond anything you have ever known, and this house will be known as a house of bread. It will be known as a house of prosperity and a house of blessing, and you will never ever have need again to finance everything that is in Pastor Micah and Pastor Lindsay's heart. In Jesus' name, God, we thank you. God, we thank you. Here's what we're going to do right now. What I've discovered is this. Every new thing God does begins with a step. How many of you have ever had a prophecy over your life? Raise your hand. You ever had a prophecy over your life? Raise your hand high. Wave at me because I can't see very well. It's dark out there. Be great if we could bring the lights up in the audience because I just love to see everybody. Come on, raise your hand if you had a prophecy over your life. How many of you had a prophecy that came to pass over your life? Come on, all over this place, all over this place. Wave at me, wave at me. How many of you ever had a prophecy over your life that didn't come to pass yet? Come on, raise your hand, all over this place. Prophecy didn't come to pass yet. Here's what I've discovered. Keep your hand up just for a second. Here's what I've discovered. I've had businessmen, friends who had prosper, who have had prophecies of prosperity and blessing and kingdom financing over their lives and I've watched those men die without that ever happening now let me tell you what happens every time a prophecy doesn't come to pass that is from God God is waiting on you to do something else and until you hear him and you do the thing that he's asked that prophecy will not come to pass Every prophecy of God is contingent upon a human being doing something to align themselves with God's next. I don't know what it is, but what we do this morning is going to be used as the precursor as maybe, listen, just the step to the step. What I found out about a lot of businessmen is they want the prophecy but they don't want to be taught. They want the prophecy, but don't tell me what to do. I'm a CEO. I know how to do what I need to do. No, you don't. Because it takes more than you. It takes a prophet. And I have come here to prophesy the fact that you are going to break through this. But you've got to listen. I have envelopes here. This is what we're going to do. This is the only way I know how to do it. Is because if we are praying that God is going to make us financial investors, we have got to sow a seed, a real seed in the ground. This wonderful, wonderful, fertile soil today. You say, I already give. I know, I know, I know. This is a prophetic act. And what we're saying to God today is this. We sow this seed as a prophetic act. We invest this as a prophetic act. Folks, this is what I pray over you. I pray that the seed you give, which will be significant today, will be the smallest offering you will ever give from this point on that God will begin to bless you exponentially immediately now listen this is what I'm going to do I'm going to pray a prayer of anointing Father God Lord I pray anointing over these gifts so, so symbolically I don't pray over the envelopes and I don't pray over the money in them or the checks or the giving online but I pray over those who give. So because I cannot touch every person who desires 
to be an investor in this church. And Lord, my mind's still blown by this. You know it. I, I'm amazed. But Lord God, what I do today is that I pray over every investor. And I pray that they will set their face like a flint towards your purposes and they will expect to become your hands, your feet, your mouthpiece by financing the work of the kingdom in the earth. So right now, I anoint them. Everyone that picks up one of these envelopes, Lord, I pour the oil upon them. And I pray that as they take these anointed envelopes, not envelopes that are anointed, not offerings that are anointed, but investors that are anointed, that this will be the beginning of a new era in the history of the house. Oh, folks, I see the future, and I can tell you it is glorious. Give the Lord praise right now in this place. Give the Lord praise in this place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on. Give the Lord praise. We can do better. Give the Lord praise in this house. Listen to me. This is the way we're going to do this. Listen to me. I want you to come as households. Right now, if you don't just come and leave your wife at the seat. Don't just come and leave your husband there. I want you to step out as households and get one of these envelopes. And I want you to stand there for a moment. And I want you to say, Lord, this really is my heart. I want to be an investor in your kingdom. So many of you see things happening in the world and you say, if I had money, I'd do this or that. I know, because I do the same thing. And let me tell you something. My breakthrough's coming too. I said, my breakthrough's coming too. I know I'm a prophet and priest under the Lord, but I can tell you, I want to be an investor too. I want to invest in the kingdom of God. Amen. Worshippers, we begin to worship right now. We begin to worship right now. And this is what I want you to do. You put your most significant offering in that envelope. And God is going to recognize a first step. It may be a baby step. But it's a first step that we affirm the fact that we indeed want to be the investors of the living God.